Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians chapter 1, and we've looked at this now for several weeks, uh, the, the very fact that, that this verse gives some, some vernacular that's found nowhere else in the Bible. This is a series we're doing on the miracles of Jesus. Say that with me. The, <clears throat> the miracles of Jesus, and, and the, 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 the greatest miracle that our God's ever performed is our subject matter right now at this particular time, the greatest miracle. Uh, and again, does us, does us uh, as, as human beings, uh, as children of God, it does us uh, a great deal of, of, of good, benefits us tremendously to understand and see that the greatest miracle was not natural in nature. It was not temporary in nature. When you're being chased by uh, Pharaoh's army, uh, and, and they're coming at you with chariots and spearmen and swordsmen, and they're chasing you, and, and you're facing the sea. There's no one else to run. They're around you on the north. They're around you on the south. They're, they're crushing in on you and closing in on you, and there's nowhere to, to, to turn. Uh, you probably don't want a spiritual miracle. You probably don't want to hear a, a, a great doctrinal message on the, the, the miracle. You, what you need right then is the ocean to open up behind you. Uh, either that or you all, you all have, have the ability to walk on water and just get away from them. And, and the Lord opens the ocean. That's a great miracle at that particular moment. That's a great miracle at that particular time. And it is what they needed at that particular time. The fact that they were in the desert for 40 years. Uh, and as we said, there's no restaurants, there's no fast food, there's no grocery stores. Uh, there are no distribution centers. There's not even any refugee camps. <laughs> they are the refugee camp. Uh, and, and they're in the middle of the desert and there's, there's no UN agency to bring them food. And, and it's, a, it's a great, great miracle that our God rains manna out of heaven to the extent that every single solitary one of those people can go out and, and gather for their families and sustain. Not one person starved. Not one person starved in 40 years of wandering in the desert where there was nothing. Not one person starved. And then we see that, that even, even in that, that God's miraculous provision uh, that's not his plan. That's not his best. Once they entered into the promised land, the day that they ate the corn that had been stored up in the land, the Bible calls it the old corn of the land. That was the corn from the previous year that had been stored up. The day they started eating that corn, manna ceased. God's, God's plan is sowing and reaping. God's plan is seed time and harvest. God's plan is you put seed in the ground and, and it germinates and it sprouts and it grows first the stalk, then the ear, then the full corn on the ear. That's God's plan. Be not deceived, God cannot be mocked, whatever a man <clears throat> soweth, that shall he also reap. <clears throat> and so we, uh, we, we started a list there of some of the great miracles of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, the miracle of creation. The sea parting in Exodus chapter 14, <clears throat> in Numbers chapter 16, that the desert would open up and, and, and the, the, the opposition to Moses would be swallowed uh, and no one else. And no one else. And then the, and then the, the desert would close back up again. Uh, Aaron's rod that budded. Their clothes and shoes, it didn't wear out. Jordan was divided in Joshua chapter 3 and they walked over. The walls of Jericho falling down flat. In chapter 10 of Joshua, the sun standing still in the sky. And, and we, can, we can go right on through the, through the Old Testament on a uh, number of great miracles. The, the three Hebrews walking in the midst of the fire. Uh, and, and the miracles in Elijah and Elisha's ministry. And, and the miracle of Hezekiah's entire army uh, disappearing overnight in, in, one, in one evening. One evening. And then we get to the New Testament, and we see some of the great miracles of the New Testament, uh, feeding 5,000, 
with five little loaves and two little fish and walking on water and water into wine. The Bible says the first of Jesus' miracles, a virgin birth, that's a miracle. And then his resurrection from the dead. All of those are, are, are miracles. And we talked about this particular set of <clears throat> verses that, that indicate uh, God's greatest miracle, the greatest exertion of God's miraculous power is when he raised him from the dead. And start out in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 1. Paul said, I don't cease to thank God for you making mention of you in my prayers that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now I'm going to pause right there and I'm going to say that... Uh, <clears throat> Without revelation knowledge, without revelation in the knowledge of him, uh, you're going to be just hopelessly, hopelessly lost of trying to interpret the Bible in the light of your own understanding. Right. And, and I'm not going to say a great deal about it because I am going to say a great deal about it on Wednesday, on Wednesday night, because we're going to be covering a topic on Wednesday night that even when the proper set of information is presented to an individual and they turn around and try to teach it out of their own human understanding and they have no no supernatural holy spirit inspiration to teach that they're just as confused it doesn't matter if they have the right information presented to them the Bible is foolishness to your natural mind, and it takes God's help for you to understand it. Amen. And that is that's crystal clear in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. It doesn't matter what information you see. It doesn't, you, you can try to put all the pieces together. You can memorize all of the words of the particular verses. But it is God and God himself and God alone that determines <clears throat> when the veil is pulled back and you have a spiritual understanding of any concept, any truth, any promise, or any principle out of God's Word. He does that. You can't force it. You can't claim it. You, you can't demand it. You can't push into it. Revelation in God's Word. Having a spiritual grasp and a spiritual understanding of God's intent and, and God's ways. It says back in the Psalms that God showed his acts to the children of Israel, but his ways only to Moses. I mean, they knew what God was doing, but they didn't have a clue why. Moses didn't have a full understanding of why, but he had enough of an understanding to, to, to comprehend that they were on a journey and it wasn't just about them. I wish more people would get it that you're on a journey and it's not about you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're caught up in something far, far, far bigger than, 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 than just us. And Moses had a grasp on that. Uh, and, and there were a lot of people there. All they, all they got figured out was it's hot. <laughs> and I'm hungry. That, 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 that's about the best they could do. <clears throat> we had it better off in Egypt. Why don't we go back? They, they, they just didn't get that, that God was on the move and, and, and the eternal God was, was taking them on a journey that would get them into a place that would affect the whole rest of the history of the human race and the millennial reign of his son. And all they could see was we had leeks and melons back in Egypt. And, and, and they, 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 they just didn't grasp much even when presented with the right information. So it's not just about information. He said, you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding. That's not these, these two little spherical shaped balls that we call eyeballs uh, poking out the front of your head that you'd have spiritual understanding, that the, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and that you would know. And then there are three things there that he would know. One of my favorite prayers along this line is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, I pray and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's one thing to know what God's will is. It's another to know why in all wisdom, and in all spiritual understanding. And, and it's imperative that you, you hunger and thirst 
uh, after that knowledge and after that understanding enough so that you pray those and pray them regularly, pray them intensely, and, uh, and pray them uh, intentionally. So he says there, <clears throat> the three things that he prays that you would know are number one, back in Ephesians 1.18, the hope of his calling. Number two, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And number three, what is the, and here's where we see it, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And we started this on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, speaking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And here, in part of this prayer, he prays that you and I would see what is the exceeding greatness of his power. We don't see that phrase anywhere else in the Bible. The exceeding greatness of his power was not on display when the ocean split. The exceeding greatness of his power was not walking through a fire. And, and having three young men walk through it with him and not be singed, not be burned, not even smell like smoke. That was not the exceeding greatness of his power. The exceeding greatness of his power, it does not say, was displayed when he created the universe out of nothing. The exceeding greatness of his power was not even displayed when he raised Lazarus from the dead or the young man in the city of Nain <clears throat> or Jairus' daughter. The exceeding greatness of his power was exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, which he worked in Christ, verse 20, when he raised him from the dead. His mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now that brings us then to this verse in Acts chapter 26. Turn back to the 26th chapter of the book of Acts with me. This is Paul testifying before King Agrippa. And, and he, said, he said to the king, uh, <clears throat> verse 22, Having therefore obtained the help of God, I continue to this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than that which the prophets and Moses said should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the what? That he should be the first that should raise from the dead and show light to the people and to the Gentiles. And we talked about the paradox that brings and the struggle that brings certain people simply because they, they, some people, just because they're looking for some discrepancy in the Bible. They're looking for some way that the Bible disagrees with itself. Ah, they found it. They found it right there. Doesn't, doesn't he know that there were three people raised from the dead in Elijah and Elisha's ministry? There were three people raised from the dead in Jesus' earthly ministry. How could the Bible right here say that he was the first that was raised from the dead? And, and we've, we've discussed now for the last two services and now this morning again, that the death being referenced in this particular verse, that death is not the cessation of breathing. It's, it's, not, it's not the cessation of blood being pumped through your system. That, that's the, 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 the common medical, uh, uh, I've, I've been in rooms on, on numbers of occasions, been in emergency room situations, and, and, and they call it and said that, that person's dead. That person's dead, they have no heartbeat, they have no pulse, they have no brain activity, they have no circulation, their temperature is dropping. We would say, we would say, According to our Bible, their spirit has left its body. Like it says of Jesus hanging on the cross, he gave up the ghost. His spirit left his body. We know we're spirit. We have a soul. We dwell inside of a body. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, uh, we're three-part being. And when that spirit departs, Paul said, we depart and be with Christ, which is by far the best. We, we are absent from the body. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, we're absent. It says in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse Verse uh, 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 5, it, it says we're absent, excuse me, verse 6, it says we're absent from the body and uh, we're present in the body. That means we're absent from the Lord. And because we're present in the body and absent from the Lord, verse 7, we have to walk by faith. But verse 8 says one day we'll be absent from the body and we'll be present with the Lord. And we don't have to walk by faith. We'll have sight. 
Yeah, be right there in the Lord's presence. And so you can be present in your body or you can be absent from your body. And, and, and uh, just being absent from his body is not the death that, that the Bible references when it talks about Jesus. And it talks about him descending into death. And it talks about him being raised out of death. That death is a spiritual condition, a spiritual nature that results from sin. The spiritual nature that is the result of sin that separates one from the presence of God for all of eternity. And that's the death that it's referencing here. It says, once again, that he should be the first, that he should be the first to rise from the dead and show light to the people and to the Gentiles. And so him being the first, him being the first, we, we took up then to, to discuss the different people in the Bible that were raised from the dead. Were they raised out of death or were they simply brought back to life? And then the key there, were they raised out of death or were they brought back to life, is did they go on and die again? Did they go on and die again? Because Jesus didn't. We, we read it in, in chapter 13 that uh, it says in verse 34, concerning that he was raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. Now no more to return to corruption. And so there was something different about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. When he was raised up, when he was raised up, he did not go on and live his normal natural human life and then come to the end of that life and die. God raised him up and then he ascended into heaven. And then he ascended into heaven. There's something different about his resurrection from the dead. And the Bible says he was the first. Now let's go on and let's, let's share uh, several of these other verses as well that talk about him being the first. All right? We'll just look at them up on the screen together. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, He is the head of the body, the church. Who's that speaking about? Jesus. Jesus. Has to go, we have to go all the way back in that chapter to find out that we're talking about God's Son in verse 13. But it gets down to verse 18. It says, He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. And then what's the next thing it says? Firstborn. He's the firstborn. Now, no, you don't ought to underline that. You ought to put highlights around that. Uh, firstborn. He's the firstborn. That's strange vernacular. He's the firstborn from the dead. It doesn't say he's the only born from the dead. It says he's the firstborn from the dead. Now don't forget, we're not just talking about somebody who stopped breathing. Somebody who was beaten and who was crucified to such an extent <clears throat> that his body gave out and his spirit had to leave his body. His spirit didn't have to leave his body. They were shocked that his spirit had left his body. They were shocked that he was already dead. He had done all the suffering necessary, and he left his body to continue the redemptive work that he did on the behalf of all humankind. He continued that work when he went to the prison house of suffering, which we call hell or the pit or the abyss. We'll look at some scriptures that use all of those designations. And he paid for our sin while he was there. He paid for our sin while he was there. But notice here it says he was the firstborn from the spiritual condition that results from sin that separates one from God for all of eternity. That's what he was the firstborn from. Firstborn from the dead. Let's look at another verse. Same chapter. Look at verse 15. We'll start in verse 14 just because it's good. In whom we have redemption. Hallelujah. You don't have redemption to anyone else. In whom we have redemption through his blood. No one else's blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. There it is again. The firstborn of every creature. The firstborn of of every creature. Revelation 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. The first begotten of the dead. Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed into the image of his 
son, that he might be the what? Firstborn among many brethren. He's going to be the firstborn, and there's going to be a whole lot of other ones born. They're going to be, they're going to be born too. Yeah, he's the firstborn among many, many brethren. So he was the first. He was the first, and you have to understand, he was the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1.18, firstborn out of death, firstborn out of that condition that separates people from God. And that's the condition that results out of sin. It's, it's called spiritual death. It's called the, the, the nature of death. And, and, and it exists in, in its first host as Lucifer. That's where sin originated, disobedience to God, arrogance, rebellion, mutiny against our God, and sin was the result. It says iniquity was first found there in him. Every single solitary human being due to the sin that took place in Eden by the parents of the human race, had that exact same nature come upon them. The exact same nature, death. We looked at it last week. We looked at Genesis 2 and verse 17, where God said to them, you shall not eat of the fruit of that tree. What's going to happen if you eat of the fruit of that tree? You're going to die. Verse 17, chapter 2, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of, for in the day. Not within a year. Adam lived over 900 years. And he said there, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now the Hebrew Bible says, dying you shall die. In other words, the death process begins in you right then. What happened? This became their nature. And that nature, according to the book of Romans, chapter 3, chapter 5, it says that that same nature now is within every human being. Within every human being. That's why we have verses like 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6 that says they're dead while they live. Yeah, yeah they're dead while they live. Here are a couple other verses. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and the 14th verse. 1 John 3, 14. We know we've passed from death unto life. These are, the, these are spiritual natures that he's talking about there. Spiritual natures. Let's ask a question. How many of you have ever been brought back from the dead? My mom was here, she'd raise all three hands. Actually, four. She's brought back from, she's brought back from flatlining in the emergency room when I was born three times. Three times she was raised from the dead. Four years before she finally went to heaven, she was taken into the ER. She was in full pulmonary, full circulatory, and full respiratory failure, flatlined. And they brought her back. Last June 28, she departed to be with Christ. She apparently was not resurrected, that death would no longer have any power over her. She came back, she lived out the rest of her life. And then she went on to be with Christ, which is by far the best. By far the best. It's appointed unto every man once to die. After that, the judgment. After that, the judgment. That was not the ultimate resurrection from the dead. She was resurrected from the dead on a day back in the 1960s when I watched her get on her knees in front of a TV screen at the end of a Billy Graham crusade and she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and she passed from death unto life. And she stepped into everlasting life at that moment, not on June 28th of last year. She went from death unto life in that moment. That's when... John chapter 17, verse 3, this is life everlasting. This is life eternal, that they would know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, your son. That's John 17, verse 3. This is life eternal, 
Not when you die and you get rid of this sin-soaked body. Thank God that's a great moment to be liberated and to be free. All pain is gone. All the limitations are gone. Uh, uh, the, the sin nature is gone even out of your flesh. But that's not when life everlasting starts. Life everlasting starts when you are born again. When you're born again. And then John chapter 5 and verse 24. John chapter 5 and verse 24. Verily I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. See that? It doesn't say anything about their funeral. It says nothing about, it says nothing about the day that their heart stops. It says nothing about when, when, when they stop having brain activity. It says, he that hears my word and believes. He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. Why? Because they, they pass from death unto life. Because death is a spiritual condition. Death in the Bible, based on its context, death in the Bible can very well be referring to this. The spiritual nature that was in you until you were born again. That's why he's the firstborn among many brethren. And he was the first begotten. From the dead. And, and, and you're born again. You pass from death unto life. Eternal and everlasting life comes to you. And you'll never come to condemnation. But you're passed from death unto life. Who is that? He that hears my word and he that believes. He that hears my word and he that believes. And so this, this spiritual condition. I want you to go to, to uh, Revelation. Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Let's look at another, let's look at another uh, biblical concept. Now, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I can tell, you know, there's a little bit of a struggle, you know, going on for some to, to, to follow this. And, and because we're talking in spiritual terms now. We're not, we're not just talking in, in, in natural terms. You remember that, that with us, you know, life begins at conception. We take our first breath when we, when we exit the womb. We breathe. We breathe in and out and in and out and in and out. Inhale, exhale. And then one day we just exhale. We don't ever inhale again. And our body grows still. And our body begins to cool instantaneously. Because when that spirit leaves that body, that body no longer has any life in it. But that happens to a person that's spiritually alive or spiritually dead. Right. Doesn't matter if they're spiritually dead or if they're spiritually alive. They're still, they're still going to stop breathing and their spirit's going to leave their body. And it's going to either ascend or descend, one or the other. Yep. And so, so uh, 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 no matter when we say natural life starts and no matter when we say natural death is determined... Because we just started doing the brainwave thing not, not too many decades ago. And, and, and uh, before that, it was always pulse and blood pressure and heartbeat. And, and, and uh, uh, pumping blood throughout the body. And, and then they started to determine, well, there's actually still some brain activity going on. But, but just, just when everything else is still and everyone agrees and determines, yeah, this person's dead. Their life is over. Their life isn't over. Their life isn't over. There, there is an after that. There is an eternity. And, and, and uh, uh, we, see it, we see it in our Bible. We see it in that very verse, Hebrews 9.27. Uh, it's appointed unto every man once to die, and after that, and after that, the judgment, and after that, the judgment. There is an after that. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead yet, yes. shall he live. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, to we as Christians, it says, then shall the body return to the dust from whence it came. But the spirit shall go on in life. The Spirit shall return to the God who gave it. Now let's look at some of these verses. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And oh, let's see. Let's see. Where shall we? Oh, I'll just pick it up right in verse 5. I, I, I want to read all of it because I like, I like the part where the devil gets chained up and tossed. 
verse 2, but, but for time's sake, the rest of the dead shall not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, for the second death has no power on them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. The thousand years are expired. This is known as the millennial reign of Christ. A thousand years expired and, and Satan is loosed out of his prison, goes about deceiving people and coming against God again. And verse 10 says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast... See, there's no end to him either. I, I read an article just recently uh, from some well-meaning individual that's thoroughly and totally confused because trying to, trying to understand spiritual things with, with a, a natural mind. It cannot be done. And his analogy was, well, have you ever seen a, a campfire? Have you ever had a fire in your fireplace? Uh, have you ever had just a pile of leaves? I mean, everything's thrown into that fire. And then when the fire's, do the fire's done, everything has been consumed, and then the fire goes out. So we know that people that are just going to go to hell are going to be consumed, and then the fire's going to go out. You're, you're, you're trying to speak of spiritual things from a natural understanding. doesn't say anything about being thrown into a pile of leaves. That's right. That's right. It's, a, it's, it's very, very clear whether I can understand it or not. Right. The Bible's true. God's accurate in everything he says. And it says that verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. <laughs> Jesus said, Jesus said, don't fear the people who can kill your body. Fear the, fear the God that can kill you and put you in a fire that never goes out. That never goes out. Now, let's keep reading. I saw a great white throne. Now, you, you'd be really glad. You, you'd be really thankful. You'd be really appreciative your whole life long that you're not going to go to this judgment. You're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. And, and, and this, is, this is not for those who are in Christ. This is not for believers. This is not for Christians. These are the people that weren't part of the first resurrection. Remember the first resurrection? Remember that? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The last trumpet's going to blast and blow and Jesus is going to descend and, and the dead in Christ will rise. Do we have the living Bible? We have that on our... Yes or no? No, no we don't. All right, who has a living Bible? Anybody have a living Bible? You have one? Bring it to me. Bring it to me. You want to read it or you want me to read it? Bring it to me or I'll have you read it right there. Yeah, you can read it. I'll give it back to you in just a moment. I just want to read this. You all just take a break or whatever, but I, I, just, want to, I just want to bless myself. Look at this. Look at this. The resurrection of the dead. What a great chapter. I'm just going to read. Don't put anything up there because you don't have it. All right. I'm just going to read to you 1 Corinthians. You can write it down, but don't turn your Bible. Just listen to this one. You don't have a living Bible. If you would have, you'd have run up here. All right, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just going to read verse 52 through 54. You ready? Yes. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the trumpet is blown, when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. I mean, clap big. That's the first resurrection. And if you're a believer, you're going to be part of it. Praise God forever. The last trumpet's going to blast, and the dead in Christ will be changed incorruptible. Their bodies will be resurrected. They'll get a brand new glorified body and, and be unified with it. In, in, if, in, 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 in less time, it takes you to be changed. And your body will be changed, and you'll be re reunited with them. That's the first resurrection. 
Blessed are those that have part of the first resurrection. The second death has no part, no, 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 no power over them. Verse 12, and I saw, I'm back in Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, that's the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. You cannot be saved according to your works. And everyone at that resurrection will be judged according to what they've done. You cannot go to heaven based on what you've done. It takes the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the provision of God. That is His plan, and that's His only plan. No exceptions. Salvation is by grace, through faith, and that's a gift of God. There is no, there, there, there's no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. God has a plan, and that's it. And it's the only one. You come through his Son. You cannot live a good life. You cannot be good enough. The Bible is clear with it. Everyone here at this resurrection has not accepted Christ, not accepted Jesus, has not put their faith and trust, reliance, hope, and confidence in Him, and they're going to have to be judged according to their works. And let's see what happens. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever's not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, you don't have to go up very far. Verse 10. And you'll find out that fire never goes out. That's just the place of all spirits that have never subjected and submitted themselves to Almighty God and His plan. And His plan is that His Son be Lord of all. That His Son be glorified. That His Son's name be confessed as Lord of all. That's God's plan. And it's not going to change. It's not going to change for you. It's not going to change for me. It's not going to change for any of us. All right? That's, that's, that's the finality right there. I said that's the finality right there. And that is for all of eternity, for all of eternity. Now, let's go back to this, the spiritual condition that results from sin. And once again, the Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. Hebrews 4.15 is very clear that he was tempted in every way like we are, but he never, ever, ever sinned. Well, then how was it that that he came into this condition if he never sinned. How is it that perfect God, perfectly born, perfect lived life, perfect sacrifice, why would he have to descend into hell? Why would the Apostles' Creed read he descended into hell? Why would that be if he never sinned? If the wages of sin is death, then why would Jesus have to descend into hell. And Bible again is very clear on this. 2 Corinthians 5:21, he was made to be sin. He was made to be sin. He was not he was not a sinner. He did not he did not become a sinner. He became sin. He was made to be sin. Notice the verse. There it is right there. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he bore our sins in his own body. Where? In the Garden of Gethsemane? No, not in the Garden of Gethsemane. He bore our sins in his own body where? When he stood before Pilate? No, he did not bear him when he stood before Pilate. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree when? When he was crawling through Jerusalem with that cross beam? No, that's not when he bore our sins. He bore our sins when he hung on the cross. When he hung on that cross, God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He bore our sins in his own body when he hung on the cross. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. If you have a Bible, if it's, if it's electronic, go back on your device and let's together look at Isaiah chapter 53. This is known as the redemptive chapter. This is the chapter of redemption. The chapter of redemption. And let's look at it again. Isaiah 53, are you there? All right, still hear pages turning. That's okay. It's music to my ears. Love it when people are opening their Bible, reading their Bible, studying their Bible, referencing their Bible. Thank God for it. 
All right, the whole chapter is so wonderful. So wonderful. It's about Jesus. The whole chapter here is about Jesus, all 12 verses. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He'll grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Stop right there. Stop and read some of the descriptions of Jesus that talk about how wonderful he was in the perfect complexion and the flowing chestnut-colored hair, how beautiful that he was and above all other specimens of humanity. I mean, whoever wrote that was very poetic and very esoteric, but didn't know his Bible. Because the Bible said, the Bible said there's no beauty about him that we should desire him. There's no form or comeliness. He was despised. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. See, they stood right there, and they were just sure it was God punishing him for claiming to be God's son. He was up there suffering for us. What a great chapter. We're going to read it all, so get out your pen, get out your marker, get out your highlighter. Here we go. All right. He was wounded for whose transgression? Right. He was bruised for whose iniquities? Right. He, he, he was chastised for whose peace? Right. Ours. And with his stripes, who's healed? Yeah. We are. All we like sheep. Underline all. Before you think of yourself more superior to any other member of humanity. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep, people, people, I mean, again, in just their own puny, pitiful human understanding, question God. How is it that a loving God could, could let one person go to hell? If he was truly loved, he wouldn't let one person go to hell. He would save everyone. Listen, listen, God is under no obligation whatsoever to even save one. Not even one. It's only by God's grace that even one human being is born again. It's only by God's mercy that only one single human out of all the 16 to 18 billion that have ever been born and walked this planet, it, 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 would, it would still be the grace of God if only one were to be saved. Unfair that God doesn't save everyone. They could all go because all have sinned and the wages of that sin is death. It's only because of the goodness of God that anyone is saved. Only because of the goodness of God. No one has earned it. No one deserves it. No one has, has performed. No one has done anything worthy of the salvation of our God. No. And to be given everlasting life. No one. Not even one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet He opened not His mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before the shearers is mute. So He opened not His mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Almost sound like God knows what's going on, don't it? They brought him out of prison. They took him to the judgment hall. And who shall declare his generations? He was cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Was he stricken. It says here in the margin of my Bible, punished. He was punished not for his own transgression. He was punished for the transgression of people. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. He's beyond sin. He's above sin. He never sinned. He was tempted in every way as us. I mean, he never sinned. He, he was there for the transgression of my people. The iniquity of us all was laid upon him. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, for he had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He was made a sin offering. He was the sin offering. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. 
Every Christian, all their life and all of eternity, better be thankful that the wrath of God has been satisfied. Yeah. That the wrath of God has been satisfied by his sacrifice. By his knowledge shall <clears throat> my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear whose iniquities? Yeah, not, not his own. He, he, he never sinned. He never sinned. He lived a perfect sinless life. But he will bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, divide the spoil, his spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto D E A T. H, he did not pour out his body to death. He poured out his soul unto death. This is not talking about his body that can't pump blood anymore. It's talking about the spiritual condition that results from sin that separates a person from God for all of eternity. He poured out his soul to that extent. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what Jesus did. That's what happened to God's son. That's what our Redeemer did. Our iniquity was laid on him for the transgression of my people was he punished. He did no violence. No deceit was found in him. He was made a sin offering. God's justice and, and judgment was satisfied. He bore our iniquities. He poured out his soul unto death. He bore the sin of many. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He bore those sins. Now we shared with you last week in Leviticus chapter 16 about the scapegoat about how the scapegoat and how the high priest would be, would be anointed by God, would be anointed by God. It wouldn't be something that, that most people would, well, God would, uh, would anoint a person. I thought God laid, anointed you to lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. I thought God anointed you to preach great rousing sermons and teach concepts and principles and truths and doctrine from the Bible. No, God anointed the hands of the high priest to bear the sin of all of God's people and he would lay hands on that goat. He would lay hands on, it was called the scapegoat. And God would transfer the sin of all people onto that goat. And then what would happen to the goat? The goat would be taken out into the desert. The goat would be taken out into the wilderness, never to return. The goat would be taken out there. Now, in his book, in his book, The Mishbah, which is a 1933 publication, not something brand new, almost 100 years old, H. H. Danby, he said the scapegoat was led away into the desert and pushed down into a steep ravine where it died. The Lord Jesus Christ had all sin and all iniquity laid on him, and just like the scapegoat, was pushed down into a steep ravine and died, suffered death down there. And God looked down in that death condition that is a spiritual nature that results from sin and raised him out of that unto immortal and everlasting and eternal life. Raised him out of there to immortal and everlasting life. Now, I want to look at a couple of verses with you in Romans chapter 10 and then Ephesians chapter 4. Romans chapter 10, because that scapegoat, that, the word scapegoat, by the way, uh, if you're uh, uh, familiar with uh, English, uh, that's still an English word that's used. Yeah, the scapegoat is defined in the dictionary as one who is blamed and, pun and punished for the sins or mistakes of another. That's what a scapegoat is. A scapegoat is one who is blamed or punished for the sins or mistakes of another. And that's what, the, that's what that was called in the Old Testament, the Hebrews, the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, by an act of the high priest, ordained to do so by God, would lay the sins of all people on that scapegoat, and then that scapegoat would go die in their place. Be led out into the wilderness, be led out into the desert, and, and according to Danby in his book, was pushed down into a steep ravine that it was impossible to get itself out of, and there it would die. There it would die. There it would die. All right, you there with Romans chapter 10? All right, Romans chapter 10 Start with verse 6, but the righteousness which of the faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep? 
into the deep. Now, other translations say either the pit or the abyss. The pit or the abyss. So when Jesus hung there on the cross, we asked the, the, the question last week. If, God's, if God was just interested in raising him from the dead, once he died and the soldiers came and they confirmed his death, you know, we'd expect the medical examiner to come, put a stethoscope on, you know, put it up there and say, no, 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 no heartbeat. Uh, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Give a death certificate. He's dead. Okay, he died. Now God just raised him from the dead. But he didn't do that. The Bible says in every gospel, he gave up the ghost. His spirit left that natural body that he had taken upon birth. His spirit left that natural body and descended down into the deep, down into the pit, down into the abyss. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, again in those same terms, ascending and descending. Verse 6, one Lord... Uh, one God, one Father who is above all and, and through all and in you all, and everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. For, <coughs> wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same also that ascended above, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so it says there that he descended into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended. Well, Jesus died and rose again. That's the happy message for us. Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died and rose again. No, Jesus died and then descended and then ascended and rose again. And without the descension, he hasn't bore our iniquities away, and they're not left down there in that deep pit, and he hasn't ascended up far above all the heavens. He first descended. Go back to Acts chapter 2. I love the word. Acts chapter 2, and, and the apostle Peter, he's preaching away. I said, he's preaching away. He, this is one of the greatest sermons. I, I, think, I think it is the greatest. I mean, he starts it out, and he stands up in verse 14, and he says, he says to you men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, listen to me. Hearken to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, only a third hour of the day. This is that spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he quotes Joel all the way down through verse 21. He says in verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you with miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did by him in the midst of you, you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands you've crucified and slain. He didn't mince any words. He looked at him and said, you're guilty. Whom God has raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David spoke concerning him. And he's going to quote from the 16th uh, Psalm here. And he says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. This is David prophesying. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue be glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. And you shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Men and brethren. Now he's talking again. Let me freely speak to you of our patriarch David. He is dead and buried. Let's not mince any words. He's still in his sepulcher. He's still in his tomb. Might just be dust. Might be a couple little bone fragments by now, but, but, but that's it. He's dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath that the fruit of his loins according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the, of the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured this out that you now see and hear. 
For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he said himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand till I make your foes your footstool. Therefore, let all the his, his house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Yeah, praise God. Amen. He raised him from the dead. And twice he said right there that he wasn't going to leave his soul in hell. So if you want to split hairs, if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, get, get uh, all, all religious and theological and say, well, you would need to tell me, was it in the pit? Was it in the abyss? Was it in the lower parts of the earth? Was it in hell? Or was it in the belly of the earth like Jonah said it was going to be? Yes. I said, yes. Because the Bible, that's what the Bible says. Yes. I don't care. I don't care where he went, where he stopped, how long he stayed in each place. It don't make one bit of difference to me. He went. All the sin was laid on him, just like the scapegoat taken out into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And down in that steep place, died. Died. Suffered death for every man. He suffered death for every man. Suffered death for every man. And after that, after that, God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. All right. Now, now uh, uh, I'm going to take my liberties and go a couple extra minutes today. Ooh, come on. Hebrews chapter 5. Woo. Come on. Hebrews chapter 5. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5. And, 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 and he says, he says to him in verse 6, see, when he ascended, and we just read there in, in Isaiah 53, I should have pointed it out there. I didn't point it out, but it says he makes intercession for my people. Yeah, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 12. I, I believe it's that last verse of, of, of Isaiah 53, the redemptive chapter, the last thing it says there in Isaiah 53, verse 12. I'll divide his portion among the great, divide his spoil among the strong, because he has poured out his soul into death. He was numbered with his transgressors, bore the sin in many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And made intercession for the transgressors. Well, these, this portion of Scripture is going to talk to us about the fact that he had to die. He had to descend before he ascended. And God raised him from the dead. And he went into heaven and sat down. And now he's making intercession for you. Well, why did he have to die? Why couldn't he just ascend his float up into the clouds without going to the cross, without suffering? You'd still be in your sin. That's right. That's right. He had to be made sin, and he had to descend, and he had to pay the price of everyone's sin and then be raised out of there. And these verses now will tell us some, uh, some things about him being raised out of there. Verse 6, chapter 5 and verse 6. And, and in another place he said, you are a priest forever. You are a priest forever. Jesus is not like any natural high priest that served during their days and, and then were gone. It talks to us about them in uh, chapter 7 in those tithing scriptures. It says, here men, verse 8, here men that die receive your tithes. He, he's, he's done dying. I said, Jesus is done dying. Jesus will never taste death again. He's done dying. He's not going to die again. He, he, he died one time, uh, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, turn over to chapter 7. Uh, you're in chapter 7. Look over at verse 21. And, and, and those priests were made without an oath, but this is the oath by him that was said to him, The Lord swore and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we should just keep right on reading here. Jesus, therefore, is made the surety or guarantee of the new covenant. The new covenant's guarantee is Jesus. And they truly were many priests because he, they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily as the other high priest to offer sacrifice first for his own sins and then for all the people. The law makes men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, makes the son who is consecrated forevermore. Now the things we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 
And skip down to verse 6. It says, And he, and he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been established on better promises. Now, I want to go back to chapter 5. Look back at chapter 5 and verse 6, and it says, He saith also in another place, You are a priest forever after the, old, after the order of Melchizedek. When did God say that to him? When did God put him into the priesthood? When did God make him the high priest of the new covenant? When did that take place? It says in verse 4, No man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, even was Aaron. Next verse, So also Christ glorified him not, to be made a, glorified himself not to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, There we go, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. What day? Today. today I have begotten thee, said also, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then it goes on, it talks about the days of his flesh all the way up to his resurrection from the dead. We looked at that last week, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and, and it, it makes it again crystal clear. Verse 33, God has fulfilled the same unto us children when he raised Jesus up and said, as he said in the second psalm, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. What is that day? What day is that? The next verse, concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption and said, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Said it in another place, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. We just read that back in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> David, after he'd served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. That's Bible vernacular for died. He laid under his fathers and saw corruption. Verse 37, but he who God raised again saw no corruption. The Lord Jesus Christ became sin for us. He had all of our iniquities laid on him. The transgression of my people was laid upon him, just like the scapegoat in the Old Testament, taken out in the wilderness, went to hell, went to the abyss, went into the pit, went to the lower parts of the earth, suffered until all of the claims of justice had been satisfied and God's judgment was upon him. And once it was satisfied, he raised him up out of there. And he was the first ever to be raised from spiritual darkness, spiritual death, spiritual separation from God as his nature had been because sin was laid on him. He was the very first one ever to be extracted out of spiritual death and brought into everlasting life. He ascended to God. He sat down at the right hand after his blood had been received in heaven as a redemptive sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9, an eternal redemptive sacrifice. He sat down at the right hand of God who said, This day I've begotten you, and you are now a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You are now forever a priest after the, old, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, he is not the only born from the dead. He's the firstborn. He's the firstborn. He's the firstborn from the dead. Now, let's wrap up. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Notice again, he says that he prays and he asks that, that God would, would open the eyes of your understanding, grace you with the spirit of wisdom, revelation and knowledge of you, that the eyes of his understanding would be enlightened, that you would know three things. Verse 18, the hope of his calling the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints, and verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. He did not say he wanted us to know the exceeding greatness of his power toward Christ when he raised him from the dead. He said, I want you to know the exceeding greatness of my power to you who believe. 
He wants you to know the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, not toward His Son when He raised Him from the dead. That great power of God, that miracle working power, the greatest miracle He ever did was first demonstrated when He raised Him from the dead. But read it with your own eyes wide open by the Spirit of God's help. What is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe? According to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Christ is not the subject you are. When he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Keep reading. Keep going. Keep going. Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also is in the world to come. Keep going. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Keep going. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Keep going. And you, come on, it's got to, come on. And you, has he raised from the dead? Has he quickened? Has he brought from death unto life? From you, has he taken from the spiritual nature that separates people from God for all of eternity? That's going to cost the devil and his angels and all the unrighteous to be put, Matthew 25, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever and ever. But you, has he quickened and made alive and brought into life eternal, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You are the subject matter here, and his prayer is that you would understand the greatness of his power toward us who believe. And he uses Jesus as the example of that power to say that was the first exertion of that power. That's why he's the first to be raised from the dead. That's why he's the firstborn from the dead. That's why he's the firstborn among many brethren. Keep reading. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. Verse 3, had our conversation in the lusts of the flesh. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us. He has made us alive. He has resurrected us. He has brought us out of death into life. He's brought us out of darkness into life. He's brought us out of the family of Satan into the family of God. And that's the good news of your Bible. That's the good news of Ephesians chapter 1. That's the good news of the resurrection from the dead. He was the first raised, but he's not the last. Colossians 1 and verse 13. Speaking about the Lord Jesus, it's his name, the the, the very last word of verse 12. And it says, who, Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That happened the day you were saved. That happened the day that you were regenerated. That happened when the Holy Spirit did that great work on the inside of you. It sealed your eternity. You don't step into eternity when you breathe your last moment out. You're already in eternity. Eternity is already in you. Eternal life is your nature right now. You couldn't say that before, but eternal life is now your nature. I have come that they might have Zoe, eternal life, and that they might have it more abundantly. In the Father, He had Zoe in Himself, and He gave the Father, the Son to have Zoe in Himself. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have Zoe. I have come that you might have it. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. First Peter 2 and verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and translated you into his marvelous light. Acts 26. You want a description of what what a preacher ought to be? Acts chapter 26. Here's, Here's... Paul's rendition of what the Lord commissioned him to do. It wasn't to go, it wasn't to go start a following. It wasn't to, to, to have, a, have a doctrine. This, this is what he said to him. This is what he said to him. I love this. I love this. Verse 14. And he says, he says in verse 19, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. 
And he said in verse 22, having obtained the help of God, I continue to this day preaching both small and great. He met Jesus. You meet Jesus, it changes you. You meet Jesus, you don't join a church. You don't get water dribbled on you. You don't go through a class. You meet the living Christ and His Spirit resurrects you on the inside. And that's what, here's, what, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Lord Jesus Himself said. You must be born again. Not you must join a church. Not you must go through catechism. Not you must take your first communion. You must be born again. That changes you from death to life, from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan, and puts you right in the kingdom of God. All those other things might be good. They might be valuable. They might not be. But if they take a person's gaze and they fix it over on something other than what the Lord Jesus Christ did, then it detracts from the plan and purpose and will and the dream and the desire of our God that His Son would bear all the sins of every single member of the human race and that their faith would be in Him and Him alone. And that He would do that work and descend into hell for them and pay the price for every sin ever been committed and they'd be transferred and adopted right into His very own family. Paul said, Jesus appeared to me. I heard a voice in Hebrew. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said in verse 15, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. But rise and stand on your feet. I've appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. And here's his commission right here. To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. It's not about joining a church, it's not about singing in the choir, it's, it's not about having a certificate. It's about being translated. It's about being transferred out of darkness. It's about being, it's about being changed by the power of God. And His power and His power alone. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. Come on, quick. <clears throat> I'm, 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 uh, I'm not running out of steam. I'm not running out of gas. I'm running out of time. In this, the children of God are manifested... And the children of the devil. There are only two groups of people on planet Earth. There are only two groups of people on planet Earth. Children of God or children of the devil. And every single solitary human being was a child of the devil. Nothing you could do about it. We're born that way. We come into this world that way. No fault of our own. None whatsoever. And you don't become a child of God, by any of the things I've just mentioned. I mean, think about it. I'm a pastor, and you're up there telling people you don't, you don't get to heaven because you go to church. You, I, I, I wish I could say that. But you don't go to heaven because you went to church. No. Going to church is something that the Lord commands, doesn't suggest. He demands. <clears throat> and, 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 and that's a result. See, that's His desire because... See, this is how America has lied to people. Get saved, get your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you'll go to heaven when you die. Going to heaven when you die is not the, not the goal. Come be saved by God's grace. And then sacrifice everything. Come to church every day if the doors are open and be discipled into one of his disciplined followers. Learn what he requires and expects of you as a person, and as a minister, and a representative of His. And for the whole rest of your life, He's going to give you opportunities for service. He's going to demand your money. What? Oh yeah, He's going to demand your money. He's going to demand your time. He's going to demand your talents and your abilities. He gave them to you for a purpose. He'll expect your worship your honor, 
your submission, your obedience, your praise, your thanksgiving, and your gratitude. He'll expect your presence. We don't tell people that. We say, get saved, go to heaven when you die. Keep living the way you want. No. Call your own shots, be your own God. No. Now I say we. We don't do that here. No. We tell you the truth. <clears throat> he expects you to be one of his disciples. No, you become a child of God only one way. Don't ever, there's no reason for anybody ever to make a mistake about this. Galatians 3, verse 26, we are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We are all children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Church attendance, baptism, reading the Bible, singing songs and worshiping God, all those things come after that. But you first must make a determination and a decision to yield your life and to accept Jesus' sacrifice. Let's close with some really basic verses about salvation. <clears throat> In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, our Bible says, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to go to school at all. You don't have to serve in the military. You don't have to hold a degree. You don't have to be married. You don't have to have children. You don't have to ever be employed. You don't have to run for office. But you have to be born again. You must be born again. You were born once into this life. You came through a mother. It's the only way here. That was your first birth. Jesus said you have to have a second birth. And that birth comes by His Spirit doing a work inside of you. You can read it right in those verses. You can read it in Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It's the Holy Spirit that does, those, does that work. It's not by your words. It's not by the, the magical prayer that you pray. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has to do that work. You have to be sincere. You have to cry out and you have to say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. Lord Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross and you bore my sins. I believe you went to hell for me. I believe that God raised you up. My faith is in you. Thank you for bearing my sins. Thank you for carrying them away. Thank you that I can receive forgiveness through you. Now please save me. Please, I want to be born again. I don't want to be a member of Satan's family anymore. I don't want to be a child of Satan. I want to be a child of God. I want to be a, a member of God's family. And I can't buy my way in, can't barter my way in, can't beg my way in. The only way to do that is put my faith in you. So I believe in you, Lord Jesus. I believe in you and I accept you and I receive you. See, Jesus is a gift. He was God's gift. John 3.16 said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus' gift. Every gift has to be received. Or it lays there unopened, unaccepted, and unappreciated is a gift. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal and everlasting life. He's a gift. Everlasting life through the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift. And what does John 1.11 say? He came to His own, but they did not receive Him. They did not accept Him. But verse 12 says, but as many as did receive Him. Is that you? I, 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 I'm going to raise my hand. Yes, yes, Lord, that's me. Have you received him? Not ashamed of it? Put the other one up with it. And, and say, I've accepted him, I've received him. I've received him and I've accepted him and I'm not ashamed of it. He said right there in that verse, as many as received him to them, he gave this divine privilege and empowerment to become the child of God. That's the only way. That's the only way to become a child of God. And that's the greatest miracle that our God ever performs. He just performed it the first time on Jesus. Aren't you glad you didn't have to go to hell and pay for your own sins there and then be raised out? I mean, that could have been His plan. That could have been His plan that, hey, here's the way we're going to do it. You can go to hell and, 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 and if you dislike it bad enough and you're willing to do what it takes. Listen, 
I don't want to put the tip of my little toe in hell, let alone any more of me. I wouldn't want to spend one nanosecond in hell, let alone three and a half days and three nights. He descended into hell. He descended, his soul descended into death. Bore our sin, and the only penalty there is for sin is death. That separation from God for eternity. No second chance. No second chance. Forget all the teaching you've heard about, well, if you go and you're good and you get out early on good behavior. None of that. You don't read that in the Bible. I'm sorry that it upsets some of you, but the word purgatory is never found in the Bible. There is no second chance. Make your decision today to put your full confidence and full hope and full reliance and full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did and tell him about it. And tell him about it. Romans 10 and verse 9 says, you have to believe that God raised him from the dead and you have to say this with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. I confess your Lordship. Jesus is my Lord. If you've never done that before, you ought to do that not, not even today, right now, right now. And you ought to write me a note and you ought to send me a card and you ought to send me an email and, 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 and you, ought to, you ought to drop me a line and say, I did that today, Pastor Clemens. I accepted Jesus' work on the cross for me, for myself. I believe God raised him from the dead and I confessed him for the very first time as my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Sign it that way. Jesus Christ is my Lord and send it to me. And I didn't tell you don't be part of a church. I didn't tell you don't go through a membership class. I didn't tell you don't, don't send your kids to confirmation. They, they, that can be really helpful. I believe in water baptism. I believe in all those. They just, th- that doesn't save you. That doesn't save you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, you have to call on his name. You have to confess that he's your Lord. You have to believe what he did for you. And that's a gift. And that's a gift. <clears throat> and that gift... And that gift is available for all. Revelation 22 and verse 17, whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come and receive. Whosoever will, let him come and receive the water of life that flows freely. The water of life that flows freely. I'll stand before you this morning. And share with you unflinchingly, without any reservation, no hesitation, that if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith is in His work on the cross and in His ascension, and God raised Him from the dead, and you confess His Lordship, you have been delivered from death. You have been brought from death unto life. Eternal life is your nature at this very moment. Because of it, the fruits of God's Spirit are inside of you, and, and they're developing, and they're, and they're showing out. Righteousness is now your nature. You're right with God. You're justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the last trumpet sounds, if your spirit's already ascended and already in heaven, you're coming back with Him. And your body will be changed and you'll get it back before we even get there. And we who are alive and remain will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and caught up together with you in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 17. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then there's a thousand years going to pass on this planet after that. What do we get to do, Pastor? We get to rule and reign with Him. And then at the end of that thousand years, the final judgment. And the final banishment into final punishment. Separation from God for all of eternity. That's what this death nature nature causes. What will happen to us, Pastor? Will there be a new heaven and a new earth? The Bible says, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. There will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And sin will have completely be put away. That sin which was initially seen in Lucifer... Iniquity was found in you. Iniquity was discovered in you. Though you were perfect from the beginning, iniquity came about into you. That's what God is putting away. And we're caught up in the middle of it. Aren't you glad? 
We got caught up in redemption. We got caught up in salvation. We got caught up in God's goodness. We got caught up in righteousness. We got caught up in the work of redemption that swept many brethren into God's family. He was the first of them, the firstborn among many brethren. Brethren, sister and two, let's stand. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.